morning, guys. Dr. Ken Norberg here again with another fireside hunting seminar. You know, COVID-19 is kind of keeping us indoors, and so we have to put up with having to be indoors for these seminars. I'm really anxious to be out there in the woods, but we'll get there one of these days. Well, anyway, um, I've got a really interesting subject. I I'm starting out uh, talking about a deer I took quite a few years ago, about, oh, 25 years ago. Uh, a special deer. It's a big one. It was a huge deer, but kind of interesting. But that isn't the main part of what we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about lures. And there's lots of things a hunter should know about lures. <laughs> And so we'll get into that in a little bit, but we'll start out by talking about the taking of this particular buck. Now, this buck was huge. <laughs> uh, he, he dressed out at uh, 243 pounds. I weighed him back home in my garage before we started butchering. Which, and at that weight, it meant that he weighed 305 pounds live, and that was a huge deer. And I think, if I recall, that was probably the first deer I've ever taken that weighed over 300 pounds, my first buck. And uh, since then, I've taken quite a few of them, and so have my sons. And uh, so, where we hunt, that, that, that size is not uncommon for older bucks. Now, they don't all get to be that large, but a fair number of them do. And generally, when they do, they become dominant breeding bucks, meaning they're the boss buck of the square mile in which they live. And, when, and remember now, when I say square miles, I, a square mile of a, of a home range of a deer is not square. <laughs> it's usually oblong from east to west. And uh, I've thought about that many times. Why would it be oblong from east to west? Because, well, the prevailing winds are from the west, and I suppose if they have to move a great distance to get away, you know, to run away from wolves, for example, uh, they'll have more room to work within the range when it's shaped, when it's oblong from east to west. Doe ranges aren't like that. Most of them are, well, they're irregularly shaped, and uh, like a pancake with all kinds of lobes all over it, but uh, they're smaller, and there's usually four or five of them within a buck's home range, and that's that's the way they're divided. And then on those doe ranges live the yearlings of those does. They live with their on their mother ranges throughout their yearling year, and uh, and then their fawns are in there as well. And then besides those does and fawns and yearlings in that buck's range are usually oh, anywhere from two to five other mature bucks older than yearlings, two and a half year old to six and a half year old. And some of those older bucks that are not dominant can be get to be quite a bit large. They can be trophy sized bucks. And, uh, you know, a trophy buck, in my book at any rate, I don't know how you think about it, but a trophy buck is any buck you think is worth having mounted. That's a trophy buck. That's your trophy. Now, other guys might think, well, I don't want those, but I know guys that have a lot of two-and-a-half-year-old trophy bucks on their walls and, and others that have that don't put that size up there. And uh, my boys and I have none that size on the wall. So well, we might have the antlers, save the antlers, and, and do European mounts, and I'll show you, I'll talk to you about European mounts here today too. Well anyway, so uh, that's kind of the way they're divided up. Well, this particular buck, this 305 pound uh, white-tailed buck was, was uh, you know, he was a dominant breeding buck. And everything about him was big except his antlers, <laughs> which is not uncommon where we hunt. I, we, you know, his saving grace was that he was a, an extremely aggressive buck, and I found that out before I took him here on this particular morning. And uh, 
sometimes being aggressive is more important than the size of antlers or how many tines are on the antlers. Uh, uh, are on the antlers. I, I, I know of a buck in Wisconsin, he was a mere eight-pointer. Well, I shouldn't say mere, but he was an eight-pointer, but not really large antlers, who was a dominant breeding buck and actually killed a much a buck with much larger antlers, a ten-pointer, and uh, one day. And so I was, I, I was able to investigate that and figure out what happened there. But at any rate, so, but aggression means a lot if you're going to be a dominant breeding buck. But of course, bigger antlers will give you more leverage, you know, and, and uh, a better ability to like to turn the head of a buck when your antlers are engaged and maybe make that neck on the other buck start to give away and, and the buck has to give ground and finally leap away for fear of being injured. And uh, so big antlers have an advantage, but that, that isn't always the case. Well, okay. Now, before we start, I want to mention here quickly that, you know, we're just a few days from the month of August. And that means we're, in a month, we're going to start, uh, everywhere in the United States, uh, we're going to start hunting white-tailed deer, the bow hunting. The archery season's open now. And there's special seasons in some, uh, in some specific areas in a lot of states that start early as well. And uh, so that's coming up pretty quickly now. Now, you know, I've spent most of my life, I, I'm 85 now, but uh, I started studying whitetails, um, habits and behavior, hunting related habits and behavior, beginning in the early 1960s and started doing it scientifically in 1970 when my kids were starting to come to deer camp. And I've been at it ever since. And here I am, all these years. So uh, that's a long time. Well, all that, all that study, all the research we did, uh, was geared toward creating hunting methods that were mature buck effective. We we wanted to be buck hunters only, and uh, we succeeded in that very well. But we learned an awful lot about bucks <laughs> and their behavior and about the rut. Uh, in 1990 I was the first person uh, ever to accurately describe the whitetail rut because of those studies. And uh, so we knew a lot about that, and that all came in handy if you're going to be a buck hunter. That's important thing, important things to know. But well, we did all this all this time, and we're still doing it. I mean, you know, white tails never seem to quit adapting to whatever us hunters do, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. And uh, because of that, and they seem to be getting smarter, you know. White tails are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. Most of us give them credit for. They're really smart animals, and they have excellent memories. And there are people who doubt that as well. But doubt it if you want. It's absolutely true. And I've been around wild white tails so long and seen so much. Uh, believe me, that's true. Well, because of that, no matter what we do as hunters, to, well, we're hunting white tails. They keep learning how to counter it, how to, how to survive with whatever we come up with. It isn't true of, you know, fawns and yearlings. They still have a lot to learn to be able to survive in the, in the wilds on their own. But any whitetail that survives three or more hunting seasons is at an age where he can learn very well, put things together very well that will enable him to keep surviving. And that's how big bucks get to be big bucks. <laughs> and they've been doing it to us for years. And right now we're at a time in stand hunting when we're all suffering the same problem. That stand hunting isn't near as effective as it was, say, back in the 
mid 80s to mid 90s when tree stands were first introduced and doe and estrus lure stands were first to deploy, buck hunting was really easy back in that span of time. And since then it's becoming less and less effective. The same with lures, you know, certain, what, what's happening is, you know, you, what you can bet on with whitetails is that no matter what you use, the method you hunt, the gadgets you use, the lures you use, the equipment you use, it's going to have a very limited period of a maximum effectiveness. When I say maximum, I mean it might work yet today, like stand hunting works yet today, but not near as well as it once did. Once did. So, uh, and there's a possibility it might work again under the right circumstances. I'm going to talk about that. But those white tails have just wiped out the effectiveness of every new gadget that's come along, including lures and now including uh, uh, food plots, that we're just having a hard time doing our job as volunteers in whitetail management by keeping whitetail numbers within the carrying capacities of their range each year, but particularly in winter. Every, almost everywhere where whitetails live, every state, there are areas where whitetails are overabundant because we are not enabled, we aren't able to keep their numbers down sufficiently. And, I, and, and so we're, what a lot of crazy things that uh, wouldn't have been allowed years ago, like, boy, if Teddy Roosevelt were alive today, or one of the founders of uh, the Boone and Crockett, Crockett Club, he'd be furious <laughs> to hear about things hunters are doing today to take whitetails, like using food plots. You know, he was, he was so intense on making sure everything we did while hunting deer was fair chase. And uh, so, but what are we going to do? We've got to keep those numbers down and so we become a little lenient about what we can do to help keep those numbers down and food plots is one of those things. It, it works, but it's not good and, and it isn't and it's not going to work forever. I mean, that too has a limited period of time of maximum effectiveness. Well, anyway, I start out by saying <laughs> a little bit, I get on a tangent now, but you know that, about books. You know, with, with bear hunting coming up now, it starts first of September, uh, and deer hunting coming up in September. Uh, well, you got to start thinking about bear and deer hunting this year, what you're going to do to do better than last year. Now, if you're just planning to do the same things you did last year, uh, the odds are you aren't going to have any better, any more success this year than you did last year. And if you're satisfied with that, well, that's okay. But if you want to do better, and you have to be, you have to change things. You know, the old traditional methods of hunting are not, none of them are doing as well as they did years ago. And obviously, what you need to do today to be, uh, to, uh, be more successful, particularly if you're going to be hunting older bucks, is stand hunt differently. Learn to stand hunt differently and better. And if you don't do that, well then you're not going to do any better. And you aren't going to find very much anywhere else in the world about, about better stand hunting techniques that actually work today, you know, different ones. Uh, kind of things that white tails haven't been able to adapt to thus far and may never be able to adapt to. How about that? Uh, you won't find them anywhere except in my latest two books, uh, the bear hunting book. Uh, if, if you don't know all the things you have to do today to take a trophy class bear, you're not going to, you're, the odds of you taking one this year aren't going to be very good. I mean, there's so many things you can do wrong that absolutely prevents you from taking a trophy class bear, one weighing 300 pounds or more. And if you don't know them well, you're really, 
you know, bump, banging your head on a brick wall because you don't know what to do. Well, you'll find it only in this fifth edition of my bear hunting book. This, been, my, this thing started in 1990, and since that time, bears have gotten to be a little, more, a little tougher to hunt. And uh, so I've written new editions over the years. You keep up with that, with the changes the bears are making. So you need that soon, or you're going to, you know, you're probably going to have the same success you had last year. Maybe you got a big one last year, and you think, oh, I know it now, I what to do now. But okay, take a chance on that. Well, same, same with the hunt, my 10th edition White Tail Hunters Almanac. Look how thick it is. There's so much to know today. You become a regularly successful buck hunter. And you can't find everything you know to do that anywhere else in the world, but in here. You know, I, as far as I know, I'm the only one who's done this kind of research, and I've been doing it since the early 1960s. That's a lot of research, a lot of time. And everything that I write is based not on some goofy idea, but on scientific research. And uh, in the case of Stand hunting methods. Yeah, we, we did, my boys and I developed six new stand hunting methods over the years in the last 30 years that are are very effective for taking older bucks. And all of them were, were, were created by uh, comparing numbers of mature, uh, unsuspecting bucks within 50 yards or a, uh, uh, during 30 hunting seasons. <laughs> how, can you, how can you determine something is actually the truth better than that? So what you find in here really works, and if you don't know those things, it's the same thing as with hunting bears. So if you haven't got that one yet either, this is your best investment in becoming a, a buck hunter. You can buy all the guns and gear you want in the world, buy land even, <laughs> but or, or, or farming equipment to make <laughs> uh, food plots and, and all, you know and turnips and whatnot clover to plant them. You can do all those things, but none of those things are going to make you a regularly successful buck hunter. <laughs> That's, that, to do that takes much more, and you only find it in this particular book. Well, so enough said. Okay, back to business here. Okay, this big beer. You know, one morning my son came to camp, or one afternoon at lunchtime, actually, and said he found railroad tracks in the snow. And what that means is that he found tracks of a buck that was smelling the pheromone emitted into the air by urine from a, a doe in heat. And whenever we find tracks like that, we're really quick to hunt that buck because that doe is only going to be in heat for 24 to 26 hours. And this is a particularly good time uh, to take advantage of, the, of knowing that doe is in heat and that buck is with there and that doe is feeding in a certain place. You know, this doe had a farm. And so he found that those kind of, uh, those rare, they called them railroad tracks, I mentioned them before. He found those railroad tracks on a deer trail. Let's see, where are we here? Well, no, this deer trail right here. It's a big high hill. Boy, it really goes way up there, really high. But he found them along this trail, railroad tracks. And we knew that this area here was a favorite browse area of whitetails in this square mile. Oh, lots of red osiers in there. And, mountain maple, slap, and other saplings of, of trees and um, that, that white tails like to feed on in the wintertime. And it was snow on the ground. 
good time, but they were feeding in there. They were wandering all over there, and all those browse plants had ragged white tips on the branches, you know, that tell you, oh boy, they're feeding there, you know. They don't just bite them off clean, they're just kind of ragged on the ends, but when they do that, it's white. And you can stand there and look out there, all kinds of white, white tips out there. It's just like suddenly a bunch of little white blossoms start blooming in the browse area, but it's telling you, this place is being used quite a bit right now, so that was kind of exciting, you know, railroad tracks here and the browse area there. Well, that, that evening, well, uh, uh, the weatherman said, tomorrow the ten, uh, wind is going to blow, be blowing lightly from the northeast in the morning. So he said, well, no, we'll set it up this way. Uh, the Ken said, how about if I go up on the side of that hill, get up there high enough, so I can see this trail right here. You can see it down there. And then I, I'll go sit upwind, have, I'll go sit upwind on the upwind side, and there's a rocky outcropping here, like a little castle, and I'll go sit up up there, and I decided when I got there to sit where I could keep an eye on this trail. And because there were a lot of tracks on that trail, fresh deer tracks, including four-inch tracks made by a big buck. So I said, wow, that big buck has been on this trail. But this is all part of his square mile home range, you know, his, his domain. So it looks, looked pretty good. And so what that works, what we were doing is a hunting technique that we call the gentle nudge. And it's called the gentle nudge because you only use human airborne odors to keep deer from going uh, into the wind. And so when yeah, we don't push them. If, if I went up there and, oh, we knew that buck was down there and I attempted to make a drive through there, the first thing that buck would do, boy, he'd get out of there in a hurry. And first thing he'd do is start running into the wind so he could avoid ambushers and, and get far away from there. He probably wouldn't be back for a week or two after that kind of a thing. That's a terrible thing to do. Bucks just hate to be pushed in any one direction by humans, or wolves for that matter. So anyway, uh, we don't do that. We just set up, it's kind of like a fence line. Here's my scent is spreading out downwind, light wind, and all everywhere from here way over to here. Those deer down there could smell me. And so when they were done feeding, they wouldn't come this way toward me. They would go this way, and Ken sitting up here watching this trail had the best chance of seeing them. So yeah, well that looks like a good plan. So we got out there at 6 o'clock in the morning, and Ken was very careful. He kind of took a roundabout way over the hill and went down there uh, over to this spot to sit here. And on the way there, he found all kinds of great big beds, deer beds, in the snow. And these were no small beds. They were 55, 56 inches long, huge beds. And, oh man, this is where that big buck beds. He beds up on this hill where he can kind of watch around the country, see a lot, you know, people going up and down this old logging road, just us, and we were, this is where we hunt. And you could keep track of what we were up to. Well, he we got up there and uh, he saw all those beds, and that was kind of exciting, and he said, boy, when that buck, that if he if the doe is not an estrus, he's going to come right up there, if you know if it's not an estrus anymore. And I got two chances to take that thing. So anyway, he was feeling pretty good about that spot. And so I went over there, and I was saying, well, I'm just doing my job. I probably I don't have much chance of seeing that buck, so I'm just well, I'm just kind of taking it easy there. And I couldn't see far. I, this is all brushy here. Brushy along the road here, there are lots of elders and and uh, all along there, and uh, it's brought, it, there was a fair amount of browse on the hillside coming up to this outcropping, but it was all mixed timber in there, and you couldn't see very far in there. You, I couldn't see the road, not at all. So we were in place, and we were sitting there about an hour and a half, and all of a sudden I noticed. You know what? That wind has switched 180 degrees. It's completely around. At 7:30, instead of being from the northeast, 
it was from the southwest blowing toward me. And all of a sudden, the gentle nudge had been reversed. I was the downwind hunter, and Ken was the upwind hunter. And I said, oh, maybe I should. Then I got a little excited about it. Gee, I might odds of seeing that buck are better, only I wish it was down closer to this, this logging road here. But anyway, because I couldn't see down there, all I could see is the area right around there. So, but anyway, I was more alert now. Well, about shortly after that wind shifted, Ken was sitting there, this buck came, came, came up behind him. He wasn't sure which direction it came from, over this way or up that way, but it was, all, he heard a noise behind him. He was looking this way, he heard a noise behind him, just a little noise, and he turned to look, and here's this big buck standing there about 30 feet away looking at him, you know, up higher, looking down at him. And of course he got kind of excited about that and he turned quickly, but before he could get his gun in position to take, the deer jumped over a ledge here, it was really steep hill by now, and he couldn't see it. At, you know, just that quick he was out of sight, but he could hear it going down there and, and down to this logging road. And then it started walking down the ro logging road over here, and he, 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 he got a glimpse of it a couple times, but he couldn't see it down there from where he was sitting. He could see this, but not over that way. A lot of brush in here as well, but anyway, I could hear it too. <laughs> sitting up here, I could hear a deer. I don't know what kind of a deer it was. I could hear it walking on that road. You know, the road was frozen. You know, click, 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 you know, on the road. Well, meanwhile, shortly before that happened, this doe had been feeding down there in the fawn, and they crossed the road and were coming up this way. I suppose they were heading toward where they bed. They probably bed up there somewhere. But they were kind of zigzagging through this, and the closer they got, then I could see them. There they were in there, chewing on tops of red osiers and getting closer and closer to where I was thinking, and I thought, oh, that buck's going to follow them right up right up to me, you know. And, uh, but, you know, I, I, I didn't see the thing, and I thought, well, maybe it's not in the heat anymore, you know. Maybe that's the problem here. But I, then I heard some more clicking on the road, and it was coming down this way, you know, down there. And meanwhile, the doe and the fawn, it, they were, nipping off tops of osiers along the way and they were coming up behind that outcropping and pretty soon they were going to be downwind of me and I thought oh boy if they start snorting all of a sudden that ruins my chance of taking this deer I was heading down the road and I was saying that could be the buck you know so the only thing I could think of was get out my grunt call <laughs> and I did you know now all those years I've been studying deer, I've heard a lot of grunts from the bucks. And they aren't all the same. You know, like people who have different voices, different bucks have different sounding grunts. And most of them sounded like this. Like that. And, but not all of them. Boy, some, there, there was a one big buck, well a couple of them, but one that I was thinking about, what I'm thinking about now was up and another square mile up north, up in that direction, one morning, and I, I was getting, going to a stand site in a clump of, of spruces, and I was only about 20 steps away from it, and all of a sudden, a deer on my left, a doe, started snorting. And that was, you know, I, that didn't happen very often, but it happened there, and it was such a long, hard route to get there, it was kind of disgusting. You, know, you do all that, and before you even get a chance to sit down, and the spot's been ruined. Well, that happened. So it was snorting and snorting and snorting. It would just didn't snort once. It just kept snorting. I bet it snorted 20 times before it finally gave up. But and it was moving away from me. And on the other side, oh, a big buck started snorting, a grunting. And I think he was trying to encourage the doe to come its way. And we'll, we'll go up this mountainous hillside here and we'll get away that direction. He was down at the bottom I couldn't see him. It was all trees and it was just getting light, you know. But 
he had the lowest, most gurgly <laughs> grunt I ever heard of. And I have, ne you know, I've got a quite a, I bought a number of grunt calls over the years, but I never heard one that could come even close to matching the sound of that buck's grunt. And he did it over and over again, and boy, I was just sick. Well, I just froze where I was standing, and I waited and waited and waited, and pretty soon it was light, and I waited and waited and waited, and never saw the buck, never had a chance to fire at him, and finally I had to give up. I said, no use wasting any more time at this place this morning, so I headed back. But anyway, but that's something to remember, they aren't all the same. Now, when I grunted, when I did this, that buck exploded. <laughs> Holy cow, he started marching up. This thing was coming fairly fast. And all the way up there was batting his antlers on brush, woody stems of trees and brush. All the way up there, clattering on that. And boy, he was marching up that hill. And he was a mad deer. <laughs> and he was probably thinking, well, that doe was up there. Because, uh, you know, it's up there somewhere, because that's where it went, you know, the track's going in there. And that's my doe. <laughs> and he didn't want any more, any bucks around in one of his does. So he, he came marching up there to kill that deer, <laughs> or at least chase it out of there. So he came up there, and there was a little space, you know, a little kind of a trail or opening that goes from that trail through the elders and brush there up to where I was sitting. I was sitting right there, not very far away, like maybe 30 feet from this trail. And, and I had my gun up. I heard him coming in, in the, the safety off, and I was waiting. And, and he walked right into that little opening and stopped, of all things, you know. He probably went wondering, where's that doe, and where's that buck, you know. And I, I, I didn't have a neck shot. That part was kind of blocked by a bunch of brush, but I could, open shot to the chest of him, so I took a high chest shot right there, and he reared up and ran up there about, up, up a little past this area and went down right there. And that was that, you know. Well, Ken didn't take long for Ken. I just barely got to that thing. Boy, it was a cold morning, so it just barely got to where it was. And here comes Ken, <laughs> all, all trip. Oh, you got my buck. <laughs> Usually it's the other way around. Usually I say, hey, you got my buck. <laughs> we set up something in our group, stand hunt, and that sometimes happens. So anyway, there was laying on the ground. Well, you know, I was kind of disappointed because it turned out it was only an eight-pointer, and his antlers weren't really outstanding. But gosh, it was a big, heavy deer, <laughs> and he was huge. And uh, so I, right away, I thought, well, you know, I was, that morning, and that day I had intended to hunt a much larger buck, which I knew to be a 10-pointer. I wanted to get that 10-pointer. But I got this 8-pointer instead. So, well, okay, that's all right. Uh, I said, save myself a taxidermy bill anyway. <laughs> anyway, I field dressed it. And we started dragging it down the hill, and holy cow, it was heavy. It was really heavy. I would drag it down to the logging road and go get my pickup and come and pick it up and bring it to town. But that was a heavy buck, really big. Now you're going to see a picture here shortly of this buck hanging in a tree behind our tent. But you'll see how huge it is. I mean, this is no small deer, and I'm not standing 10 feet behind it. <laughs> I'm standing right next to it, holding one of its front. Uh, legs because I didn't want the the, the side you know, that was open from field dressing to be showing. I wanted just side shots. I was holding the leg so it was just a you know side shot. And so I'm right there and you know I, I'm over 200 pounds. Well you can see how big this deer is. The way you know that one is well over 200 pounds just looking at him. And that was the first 300 pound deer I ever took. You know, I had some that were getting close to that, but never one like that, that large. And since then, I've taken quite a, several of that size of my boys as well. And they're common up here, but a lot of them just don't have particularly huge antlers. And it's just a genetic 
<laughs> uh, a thing there, you know, our bucks just don't get huge antlers, but some do, and that, that kind of makes up for it now and then. But we're not there just to shoot big antlers, we're, we're there to be regularly successful buck hunters. Uh, oh yeah, uh, I almost forgot. <laughs> I brought, it's called, this is a, what's, what's called a European model. It costs nothing. <laughs> You know, you get a decent buck and you feel like, oh, I, either I can't afford to have it mounted or it, I don't think it's big enough for that. You can do this. You know, every, once in a while, you know, after a hunt, and it's cold and it's winter time, and I'll put a Coleman stove on a picnic bench out in the north side of my house. And what I do, after skinning the head and and uh, you don't have to be fussy about getting all the flesh that's still clinging to the skull or what's inside the, in, inside the, the skull cavity. I, I'll put it in water, uh, deep enough in a big pot, so that it covers the whole skull and probably gets up onto the bottom part of these antlers as well. And I'll throw in a handful of soda, you know, baking soda, which will bleach the bone, make it whiter, you know. But you got to get the thing up to a boiling point and then turn it down so it simmers and it just boils lightly. And it'll probably have to be in there a couple of hours before all the remaining flesh and sinews and stuff start peeling away from the skull. Then you can take it out. Now, when my neighbor, a couple of times, he said, he's, he could see steam rising up out there in my backyard, wondering what the What's going on over there? You got to look over the fence and look, and he sees antlers sticking out of a pine pot. And he says, what, are you, what are you cooking there? And I said, Well, I'm making antler stew. <laughs> well, antler stew, never heard of that. Oh, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> so, anyway, you let it cool down then, and then all the stuff in the outer part of the skull comes off just real easy, nothing. It just falls off. And, uh, then for inside the cavities, I'll make a little scoop out of a hanger wire, you know, a stiff hanger wire. You know, double it and then bend it, you know, like a little hole, and then you can go in and pull all the, all the flesh and, and uh, uh, tissues from inside the skull out and you get it completely clean. And then you can take it over to the laundry sink and get the water going around and you can flush it out and pretty soon you got a completely bare uh, skull, minus the lower jaw. And uh, so, and then what I do is just add a wire, there's a couple of little holes right here where some major nerves come through, a little wire through there and you can hang that on a nail or whatever on the wall. And it makes a nice, a nice mount, you know inexpensive mount. And I've got a number of these on the wall in my, uh, in my office, and uh, quite a few of them. And when I used to go to all the sports shows and put on seminars and at my hunting school up in northern Minnesota, I always brought these, these skulls along so, uh, to show people, you know. Well, it's kind of an interesting buck, you know, this, this tine here has been busted off in fighting, you know, he just, that just didn't fall off. That took some mighty, a lot of hard pressure to break that, that thing like that off of that time like that. Well, he was, like I say, he was a big dominant breeding buck and really aggressive. And so he, uh, uh, he was bound to bust some tips off. So my son Dave took a really nice one one year and one side about halfway up was broken off. <laughs> It was a really nice buck, but half the antler was kind of busted off during the battle. But it was a nice buck. And uh, so, you know, well, things can happen to antlers like that. And this is, but this is, you know, antlers of a particularly aggressive buck. But inexpensive model, so you don't have, <laughs> these look all right on the wall. And I, I they call them European mount because Europeans commonly make mounts like this. Of deer and other animals they take. It's a good idea. Nothing to it. Simple. Something you can do yourself on a Sunday afternoon while the biking game is on or 
Green Bay game is not or whatever. So there you go. Now, here's what I want to talk about. More important, probably. Well, I, you know, I've been hunting whitetails for 75 hunting seasons now. 75 years. Can you imagine that? You probably don't many, know many people that have hunted whitetails that long. But uh, three fourths of that has been spent studying whitetails. And throughout that time, there have been quite a few new ideas, gimmicks and potions. I remember Buck Lurson, it was made from tarsal glands of bucks. And uh, I've taken a few bucks using that, like they were young ones. Uh, but there were all kinds of things came along, the tree stands and climbing tree stands, but lures of all kinds. And uh, I remember one lure, he had a hand warmer that ran on uh, cigarette lighter fluid and had a little gizmo on the top and you put you would pour some dough and estrus lure scent on it, put the top on and then another top and kind of a big thing with holes all our metal, put it in your pocket, you know, and that all day long it would that warm scent would be pouring out of there and everybody, oh you have to have one of those. I remember those things. But every single one that's ever come along has only had a limited time of effectiveness. A limited best time, a limited maximum time of effectiveness. Every one of them became really less effective. I mean, you, you could say, boy, that just doesn't work very well anymore. Within five to ten years, every one of them, even, even tree stands, a portable tree stand, when they go, oh, that was the best thing. Boy, here and there looked up there, they acted like they couldn't smell you, and it, 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 you take big bucks regularly, just be patient, and when it eventually show up, that kind of thing. No more. <laughs> Those things all changed. And there's a reason for that. You know, the biggest reason is white tails who survive three or more hunting seasons are smart deer. Uh, a big buck doesn't get to be a big buck unless he's smart and adaptable. And they've gotten to the point where, it's gotten to the point where bucks four and a half to six and a half years of age, and not many survive their seventh winter, uh, hardly any of them are seen anymore during, by hunters during hunting season. They've become so elusive. And to the point where, you know, a lot of people that think few exist and something's got to be done in to restore their numbers, you know, something really wrong here. Uh, those well, it's just not true because there are very few hunters in, in North America who are, are, are good enough to seriously affect the numbers of those, those bucks in those age groups and bucks in their prime. You can't overhunt them. Nobody can. And so they're there. And in areas where they're overabundant, there's even more of them now than there used to be. So that's why I say you have to do something differently nowadays, something better. And, and hunters using trail cams are finally uh, discovering, I've been saying the truth about that for a long time because they're getting pictures of big bucks they never knew existed in their hunting areas. And that gets them all excited and, and they make the mistake of thinking, wow, gee, wherever I took a picture, I'll put a tree stand there and I'm going to get that buck. And it rarely works. For the same reason most other lures, you know, take take Doanestra's lure scent. I mean, it's not dead if you use it right, but most hunters don't use it right. So that's why I say you have to do something differently nowadays, something better. Now, you know, say here's a buck downwind. You know, he, he can be a mile away and smell that lure scent. But let's say a buck is walking by and he smells the scent. Well, the way most hunters use it nowadays, that, that buck not only smells the pheromone coming from that doe urine uh, that was collected from uh, captive does uh, months earlier, he smells that, which would be exciting to him and, and something that it would really, if you'd think would really attract a deer, but it doesn't work because your sense, human sense, are accompanying that order. You know, when he's, nowadays when a buck, big buck, and a little yearling buck might not think that, you know, that way, but a big, older buck, 
especially three and a half to six and a half years of age, when they smell dough and heat pheromone, accompanied by human scent, they are fooled. They learn that. Boy, you just don't go near that. That's dangerous. That's dangerous to go there. When they smell the real thing, you know, it's, it's coming from a real live dough somewhere else that isn't accompanied by human scent. Then they're thinking, that's a real live dough. That's a dough I got to go check on. Especially if other odors that they smell are, are coming from the body and fur of the, and hoofs, you know, in the case of, of uh, trail scents, hoofs, they have glands that produce special odors, you know. If he smells that accompanying that pheromone, there's no doubt in that buck's mind that is a doe and Esther since she's anxious to breed. And so that really attracts a buck. But you see, there's really a huge difference between uh, the pheromones used by hunters and pheromones uh, that emitted by does and heat in the woods. And it's easy for bucks to begin avoiding them. And they've been doing it. You know, when you think about it, hunters that use that improperly are actually making it easier for older bucks to identify them. When they, here they come along and, oh, they smell this pheromone in the air. Oh, there's a human there too. Stay away from there. You know, in other words, you're a lot less likely to see a buck, an older buck, when you use it the way most hunters use it. You know, they'll hang this stuff all around where they're hunting and it's all going downwind. If you use it properly, and I've talked about before, instead of having it all around out in front of you because you expect the buck coming toward you from downwind, uh, put it all on one side in a line, way over there. Start quite a ways away. You don't have to see. The way we did it in the old days, you know, we used film canisters and we'd stuff it with cotton and then we'd soak e each one with uh, the dough and estus uh, lure scent to dump it in there and then snap the cover shut and then we go to out in the woods and we we would uh, march off let's see about but well, I would say about 130 yards 140 150 that far and, you know more than a football field length and then we'd put one down and we'd open one put it on the ground and march crosswind you know, wind coming this way, crosswind to where your stand is. And about every 10, 13 long steps, put another one down, you know, open, keep doing that. And the last one, it doesn't have to be at your stand. In fact, it's better than a dog. It should be out there 20, 30 yards away, 20 yards for bow or 30 for a gun hunt, away from your stand. Because closer it is, while any buck down window where you are is also going to smell your house, but it's over there and if it's that long and it's going into a huge area downwind, the bucks downwind of that section over there won't smell you. No? So they, they may not smell odors coming from the bodies and hoofs of a real live doe, but there's no human odors in there. So that's going to attract them. And we learned, and I even photographed this when making the 12-hour video series called A White Hunter's World back in 1985 and 86, that once I photographed bucks on a string of canisters like that, and they usually went from canister to canister. And, you know, they could, they be, could be way over there somewhere, and smelling your canister, they could walk up and then sniff it, and, then they go, oh, there's some smell over that way, and they walk over that way, and they, they kind of get on a line, and all of a sudden they realize that there's a line of them, and they'll go from canister to canister. But that, that draws them there, and then they can't smell you, because from once they're there, you're crosswind. They aren't going to smell you there. The wind's going this way. And the closer counters are going to draw them to within shooting range of where you're sitting. That's the only way, really, today, to properly use that kind of scent. And if you do that, your odds are much better. But don't have it, don't use it where in a way that enables your own sense to follow. But even now, a lot of bucks will probably be suspicious of that odor over there when they can't smell the odors that normally are emitted by a doe's body and fur and hoofs. I smell that, but I don't smell the doe. Well, that happens 
when a doe urinates, that urine is carried from a doe's body by it through its urine. So they might smell the doe urine somewhere and come up to it. You know, they'll be attracted to that. So their bucks will be. They might be cautious, more cautious than they would be if they smell it independent sources of a pheromone than they would be if they also smelled the, uh, the other orders uh, emitted by a doe's body. But it'll work. Not as well as it did years ago, and it never will. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's a possibility you can restore its effectiveness. Same way the grunt call. You know, I mentioned, you know, not all bucks sound like this. You know, I bought this one with this tubing on it, instead of blowing on it, you know, I don't like that sound that way. It's more mellow. Sounding like it's coming from a tube, like the, the buck is grunting into a sewer pipe, you know, so long, you know. And for that reason, that sounds much more like the real grunt of a deer, but not all of them, you know. So there's always differences. You can't, you know, Grunt, bucks that grunt normally don't do a lot of it. That one, one with the little low grunt, gurgly grunt, he grunted several times in a row. I've rarely heard deer bucks do that. Usually it's one, maybe two. They don't go around and we're just grunt, grunt, grunt all over the place. And they, even if they do, that doesn't necessarily mean other deer are going to rush to the sound. I've seen yearlings turn tail and run away on hearing a grunt from my call. Because they probably thought it was the big dominant buck and breeding was in progress and they knew that buck was dangerous right now and they didn't want to be around that deer. So there's and other lesser bucks, but bucks lower in the local buck pecking order might feel the same way about it. But if a dominant buck hears it, he won't like it. <laughs> you know, if it's close enough to the real thing, he won't like it. But you know, my Brother and I used to do a lot of fox hunting using a predator call. We used to call that sounded like a dying rabbit, just wavering little high-pitched sound. And we called all kinds of things. We had crows and owls and and uh, and mink and weasels <laughs> and fishers and coyotes and even a big timber wolf come to our call and foxes, of course. And uh, but we learn that if you if you go keep winding back to the same spot, it gets to the point where foxes won't come to your call anymore. But instead, they'll sit on a ridge out of way over there somewhere out of range, and yip and yip and and cry and carry on. And you can see them over there with binoculars, and they're just they want to come to the sound, but they don't dare because they've learned it's coming from a human. And that's because well. They probably never heard of a dying rabbit do so much crying before, <laughs> things like that. And, uh, or other, maybe it wasn't, maybe it just wasn't a real accurate sound either. It's hard to say, but, but they learn. And they all do. It doesn't matter what kind of lure it is, including a food plot. They all will learn fairly soon it's a dangerous place to be. Take a food plot. You know, you see, I see pictures on the internet all the time of guys with their food plots and hunters hunting by next to food plots. And they're all, they're all in trees where they are not, you know, up a big bare trunk like a telephone pole, sitting in a, in a portable stand, completely unconcealed. I mean, they're just, there's a hunter. Boy, the average buck today that's three, uh, three and a half years or older sees that lump on the side of the tree like that, they're going to figure right away that's a hunter and they don't want to be there. You know, when you put in a new food plot when you're hunting, if an older buck is what you want to take, you only get one chance <laughs> to take the biggest buck living in the area. And if he discovers you before you discover it, and that happens a lot without the hunter knowing it. You have no chance. Once he knows you're there, and it's even more likely if you're not well concealed, whether in a tree or on the ground, you got to be well concealed if you're going to be a, a stand hunting buck hunter uh, nowadays. Really. 
Yeah, you can't discount that. He's going to find you, or oh, I would say more than nine times out of ten before you know he's even close. He could be way out there in the woods and he's looking over there and he spots that thing on the tree and then he sees the head move, arm move, things like that. We move around. That's a hunter in a tree. They all look for, all older bucks are constantly looking for hunters in trees nowadays. And they see them no matter how high you are up there. And if they're downwind, they smell you no matter how after. You can't get too high. Now, I've tested scents. I did a lot of work with scents on deer uh, over the years. And you could be 35 feet up in a tree or higher. And downwind deer will smell you. They, and that's because, like the smell of burning wood, and not the smoke. You know, you can be next to the neighbor and there's smoke coming out of the chimney in this fireplace and you see the smoke coming up in the air. But if you're downwind, you smell that wood smoke. You know, you smell that wood burning. Invisible molecules, uh, these odiferous molecules, drop to the ground. Same with human odors. Our human odors drop drift slowly downward to the ground. And if the wind is stronger, it might not hit the ground out there 25 yards or even 50 yards in a stronger wind. It might be a while before it actually hits the ground, but as it's going downwind, it's not only spreading horizontally, but it's spreading vertically as well. And so once it hits the ground between there and hundreds of yards downwind, a deer can identify you by your smell, no matter how high you're up the tree. And for that reason, us Norbergs, we don't bother sitting 20 feet. Well, we got two ladder stands that are pretty high. That, they are not 20 footers, but there's 20 footers that you can buy nowadays, which is kind of perilous. <laughs> Boy, if you slip and fall from up there, you're probably all done deer hunting if you're, you might even be done living. So that's pretty dangerous up there, I think, personally. But anyway, all our stands are uh, 9, 10 feet up. That's as high as we go, except on a couple experimental ladder stands that we have. And one of them has been a, a, a nice buck was taken from it recently. So that, I like ladder stands because you can get into them silently. That, that's a big advantage. Yeah, you got deer nearby. They hear you climbing up a tree, and they look over there. And if they see you, that isn't going to work. But eventually, every stand site loses effectiveness. The first time a buck comes along, then your chances of taking that buck are best if you see it before it sees you or it, you, you identify it before it identifies you. But after that, it's not very good. That's one really big reason why us Norbergs change stand sites every half day. Because we've learned that very often, much more often than you care to realize, that stand site will, will lose its effectiveness. A new one, brand new one, never used before. Will it lose its effectiveness for a buck hunt within the first one to four hours it's used? And uh, we we blow it. Good. After that, you're just wasting your time there, and we don't want to waste time like that when we're hunting bucks. So we go on to a new one that's never been used before. Never used before stand sites are best for taking big bucks because there's there's nothing there, or should be nothing there to warn the buck that there's a hunter here. This is new, eh? they have to find you first and identify you there before it, it becomes ineffective. But until that moment happens, your odds of taking a big buck at this new stand site, as long as it's within easy shooting distance of very fresh tracks and droppings of a big buck. If they aren't there, well, how do you know a big buck's going to show up there? They only use about 10% of their ranges on any one day, and that can change quite often when does are, in, are breeding. And that's another reason we move a lot, because when does are breeding, and that's usually happening where we hunt in November, uh, each doe is only in estrus for 24 to 6 hours, and on different days during a two-week period. And so a buck can be with this doe in heat here one day, and with another one up to a mile away the next day, they're moving a lot, and, and they're just staying in about 10% of the ranges all this time. And if you're not in that 10% they're in today, 
Well, you're just a guy out there sitting in the woods, <laughs> enjoying looking at porcupines and Canada jays or whatever, and then moaning about not seeing any deer or no no bucks, no, no big bucks. They, they probably aren't many around here. Wolves probably ate them all or whatever. <laughs> so uh, that's part of what the problem is. So you have to move, you know, and because the effect of this of that is not very long and. They find it so quickly, so lots of reasons. Well, that happens to all lures as well. And so, nowadays what most hunters are doing, because what else have they got, you know? They, when you go to the sporting goods store, what else do you got there? You look around, what could I use to help take a big buck this year? And yeah, you see all these things with pictures of big bucks on there, and these are, this thing here, uh, makes you sense, uh, it covers your sense so they can't smell you. Well, I hate to say it, but they aren't 100% uh, effective, and and they don't, they're not long-lasting in effectiveness. They, they fade away pretty fast, but in day two, you're stinking pretty good. And if you haven't done anything to improve that, well, there's a lot of odor coming from you. And what, whether you use it or not, wherever you walk. You're putting down trail scent, and trail scent lasts four days or longer, depending on how intense it is. And today, whether you're in the woods or not, and you've been putting up stand sites, or you're sitting in stand sites, or you're out there fiddling around with a, a mock scrape, you know, right in this trail where you expect to see a buck, or um, or going out there to get your trail cam and maybe change cards. And every time you go there, you're laying down more fresh trail scent that last four days. And nowadays, you can't fool a big, well, one of the days that, that tells a big buck that's approaching that this is a dangerous place is a lot of intense trail scent around the stand site area. Nowadays, and this, you're not going to like this, but nowadays you should never go within 10 to 20 yards of the spot where you see, expect to see the buck. Stay away from there. Don't get anywhere close to it. Uh, you know, the edge of a feeding area. Don't don't go out there during the hunting season when you're scouting. You gotta do it. You gotta look around and find these things. trails the bucks are using now, or probably will be, or especially ones adjacent to favorite whitetail feeding areas. And there's a whole bunch of them out in the woods. But you, you gotta find those things then. But when you're hunting, mm -mm, you don't go out there because and and and. and and ruin that trail with your trail scents because when a buck comes along and he finds fresh trail scent at any one point, he's right away is saying, this is an area that's frequented by a hunter and if there's a lot of it every day, boy, he comes along and next day, let it smell, even if you're not there, well, oh, man, there's a lot of human odor here. From now on, I'm going to detour widely around this place. You know, that happens. So, now one of the things I mentioned that the effect, of, the last effect of this, of like this grunt, grunt call, may be recovered by not using it for a long time. You know, I haven't used this in the woods now for 10 years. That means there's a whole new generation of deer out there. About the only deer that could live that long are some does. Does will live, can live up to 14 years in the wild. A few bucks live, past, you know, past their seventh winter. So, but so. The deer that are out there after 10 years never heard this before. So maybe the next time I use it, I will attract a buck, <laughs> a big buck. But boy, after I attracted that one, that, this one here, I didn't attract anything. The only reason I carried it for a while is because occasionally, like most of I stepped on some branch that snapped real loud under my foot. I thought, oh my, that's warning every deer within hearing, and that's quite a waste. That there's something big and heavy over there. And it's probably human because humans step on twigs that snap loudly underfoot quite often, as opposed to other deer. Deer don't do it because, you know, inner part of their hoofs underneath are, are leathery, but that leathery part is full of nerves. So if they come down on something like that and they feel it there, they'll take your foot off it rather than put all their weight on it. You know, they, they don't do that when they're bounding. That's why I hear them crackling going through brush when they bound. But apparently when they're walking, you hardly ever hear that. 
about the only twig snap you hear. It isn't really a twig snap. It's a it's a deer biting off the top of a of a browse bush, a woody browse plant, and it's kind of a real soft snap and kind of ragged white tip left there because they have no front teeth, upper front teeth, but it's done by the side teeth and they chew it off. But anyway, you hear that and you, you're sitting out there and you hear one of those soft traps. And then after after a bit, oh, it's over this way now. That's almost certainly a deer. You don't know what kind unless your antlers bumping against woody stems. That, that's a sound that always excites me too. <laughs> but so now. I, my my son John has used rattling antlers out there now and then with success, and uh, it hasn't. I'm sure it's been less than ten years. So any deer that learned that that rattling there hearing is a human making the noise, uh, he's telling those deer in that area. Well, there, there's John there rattling those antlers again, and they aren't pulled at all, making it easier for those bucks to stay away. You know, there's that's what happens when they become accustomed to these things, after they've learned, you know, gotten close enough to you know, smell you or see you or hear you, uh, close enough so they could identify you and then, wow, that hunter is sounding like two deer ba uh, battling. It isn't two deer bat battling at all. And then when you make a noise with a call or rattling on us, you're making a sound that really pinpoints where you are so the chances of them identify you before you know they're there are much better than if you weren't making any noise. So, but if you can get into generations of deer that never heard it before, then it probably will work. So that can happen. I, now, after I, I'm tempted to keep start carrying this again this year while, while I'm hunting for that reason. Well, so maybe that, you know you don't want to hear that, but like I say, when you go to the store and you want to find something, what else is there? There's all these lures, there's salt blocks and minerals in various forms, and there's all these things there in the store. And average hunter said, "Well, this is all you got to work with here." And I said, well, "Hopefully, one of these things will work. I've never done that before. I'll get that and we'll give it a try." And that's going on all the time, and millions. Hunters are doing it. They've been doing this, using all these things for up to 35 years now. And if you aren't training deer to to know that when they hear or smell these things that, that it's dangerous to go there, that's crazy. You know, they're older deer. And uh, the ones, the very bucks you'd like to see are becoming so elusive because they all know these things nowadays. So today you're almost better not to use anything. And no, no lure scent, none of those things. Just use the buck's own trails and own tracks. And the real live does, whether they're in heat or not, uh, to, to, get, to give you the best chance of taking a big buck. Now, there's six ways of doing it. <laughs> and you've never done any of them. And they're all in my book. And. Uh, I, I wish every higher American could learn those things because you'd all be having a lot more fun. You know, there's nothing wrong with hunting big bucks because only about 10% of them ever get to breed. The rest of those bucks uh, don't add a thing to population of the white toad except their own presence. So they're kind of wasted, and because hunters can't take them, they end up dying in the woods for other causes or wolf food. You know, they get to be old, they get their easy wolf food. You know, as I used to know a guy, an old guy said, well, the wolves should mainly kill old bucks. And I thought, well, that's crazy. How could they do that? You know, they're big, strong, they can bug. They can jump 25 feet, 8 feet up. How does that happen? Well, they get all wore out, especially if they're down in breeding bucks by the time they're the, the sixth year of, of breeding is over. There's three phases going all the way up into January. But anyway, they're pretty worn out deer. I mean, in a normal year, they can lose a third of their weight because all the things they have to do from September through the time the does are, are breeding, uh, it's physically exhausting for them. It's one of the reasons older bucks, big dominant bucks, are much the first deer in, uh, to 
to uh, shed their antlers. They shed them around Christmas time normally, where little yearlings, they might be have their antlers till way into April. Keep that in mind now. I mean, I hate to tell you that, but don't put all your marbles into one basket by using certain lures, whatever lure it is. If you want to try them, go ahead, but don't expect him to be a, that to be a lasting thing. And, and, and remember, the first time you use a, a, a food plot one place, you got one chance to get in that big buck that lives in the surroundings for a while. If you don't get them, no. Well, how many, it, is, it isn't easy to, to make a whole bunch of them to be moving every half day to a new food plot. That would be quite a thing. I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't want to, it is unnecessary, but us hunters, using nothing like that, none of those lures, we take more bucks, and we, we take almost, a, a, us four, a buck each a year. We've been doing that for 30 years, using these six hunting medicines, and these hunting work matches work. Now, you know, there's one main reason they work is because we move every half day. Now, when you move every half day, it's awfully hard for a buck in the area to keep track of you, you know? It gets, you know, these, a lot of these bucks that we hunt, they know we're going to do that. You know, most of them don't know you're going to do it when you start hunting this way, you know, moving every half day. But I think most of the older bucks where we hunt, they all know we're going to start doing that, and we usually start that about the third day of the hunting season and using ground level stand site and sitting on their stools. Very well concealed uh, wherever you go and walking through heavy dense cover to get there and uh, on deer trails that we've cleared of branches and things. We get there real quietly and sit real quietly and we're really, and every day those bucks know we're somewhere else. And because we're not aggressive, because we're standing, we sit in trees, and because we walk a certain way going to and from stand sites, they find no reason to abandon their ranges. They stay in their ranges all season, and so every day we've got a good chance of getting a buck. But when they're, when, when they, even when they know, or especially probably, they know that we're going to be somewhere else, they can't feel safe till they find us each day. Every half day, they got to find us all over again to be safe in their home range. And a lot of bucks, they do that a lot, and some of them are really good at it. I mean, even with that, we hardly ever see them, if ever. But many of them, you know, they become more vulnerable because of that, because they got to come and find you. And sooner or later, one is going to get close without, without uh, identifying you. And, and you're going to see it. And when that happens, you know, it isn't running and just standing there or moving slowly. You're going to have a, an opportunity to take a big buck. You know, that moving every day does that. It keeps them guessing. It makes them more vulnerable. And yet, they, and it makes them stay home. They, they don't abandon their range. You know, they got all this area. They, they know they're free to live in most of their range as long as they stay away from wherever they found a hunter, a stand hunter, or even any other kind of hunter. Stay away from them. Where we know, you know, if these guys make a drive, well, they won't be around this year, so we can go back there and live normally again, things like that. But anyway, uh, they are, all the same, they have no need to abandon the area. And every time we move, they have nothing there because we use just natural cover as plants. We don't we chop up the woods, make shooting lines or anything like that. Unaltered or very little altered natural cover, we hide them, you know, fallen trees and all kinds of thick stuff, boulders. But anyway, there's nothing there to tell them that this is dangerous here. And boy, we're really careful about our, our trail sense. You know, we only walk on trails leading to our stand sites from Dalwin or Crosswind. And once a year and be there for just a half a day, just once a year. Four days later that, is, that, that trail center is gone, it's faded away, or sooner if it snows or rains. So nothing there. So all these things make big bucks more vulnerable. 
and greatly improve your chance of taking a big mark. And if you don't do that, you have to, and if you're standing you're using lure sense and not being careful about using proper concealment when, even when you're in a tree, your odds of taking a big buck are not very good at all, no matter what lures you use. So keep that in mind. So you, you, today you've got to hunt differently and better. Using old traditional stand sites are not good ways to hunt older bucks. Not, you aren't going to be regularly successful at it. So, see? That's why you got to change. That's the way it is today. So keep that in mind. This has limited effectiveness. Anything else she has limited effectiveness. And it, when it brings them toward you, you're more likely to be identified. And once identified, then stay away from the air and keep out of sight. That's fact of life. So, what I'm telling you to do, these two bucks have never seen before. You know, this is stand hunting still, but they've never seen anybody hunt this way. So, it's all new to them. And not only that, because we move every half day, how does a buck adjust to that? How, how does he develop a way of permanently or routinely keeping away from me? He can't. It, unless they become nocturnal. You know, just move at night only. And we've had bucks do that. But not very many. There have been very few in all these years of hunting them. But that can happen. That buck is impossible. Or unless there are some who early in the hunting season or even before who will migrate six miles somewhere and stay away, especially in farm areas. Uh, and you won't see them all season. That can happen. But in most cases, and there's, there's a big trophy buck in every square mile. <laughs> you don't have to just hunt one. You got, if you hunt two, three square miles, you got that greatly improves your odds of taking a big buck. So there, you got it now. That's, now you need it. Now you learn everything you need to learn about hunting methods and lures to take big bucks. And of course. I, it, all those things in the hunting methods are covered in much greater detail in my 10th edition of White Town Hunter Almanac. If you don't have yours, I advise you to get it. As you can see, there's a lot to learn. and You want to you know all this before you even start because it's going to affect the way you get ready to hunt. It will make you a better hunter in many ways. Yeah. So, there you go. See what I've been doing <laughs> in the woods all these years? And I wish you could all learn this. You'd all have so much fun. And here you'd be harvesting deer that nobody else can harvest. You know, there's even seeds out in the woods and doing it all the time. And you're not a, particularly affecting deer numbers because of that. Well, in some areas you got to where they've gotten to be too abundant because you're, you're depending on lures to, to, to take deer and uh, so and other things too. Well, with that, uh, uh, thanks guys for watching. And before you before you click the button, you know, right there, before you do that, don't do it yet. <laughs> Press that red button out there that, with the word subscribe on it. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, it, it, you'll be alerted. Every, the moment any of my new YouTube presentations will be uh, on YouTube. And uh, so, and that's kind of good to know. And then, uh, also, before I go, poke that thumbs up one because if you like what you heard today, and I can't imagine you, you, you're not liking all the things you learned. You might not like knowing that what you're doing isn't much good anymore and it isn't likely to be in the future. You might not know that. But I'm telling you how you can really change things. And uh, so, you, got, you should like it, so do that. And those are important to my future as a speaker on YouTube, important to me. So do me the favor, poke those two buttons, okay? So with that, uh, goodbye for now. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries my website bookstore, and much more.